Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Kelly bletcher -Tass, and I am the program coordinator with the York County Coalition on Homelessness. And I am the moderator today for the Diversion Prevention and Rapid Exit session, which is starting here at 2.15. Uh, with me today are Jennifer Koppel, the Executive Director of My Lanco Home from Lancaster County, and Melissa Newcomb from the McKean County Redevelopment and Housing Authority. Uh, those ladies are going to share a little bit of information about some creative programs that are happening in their um, counties uh, around diversion prevention and rapid exit. But before I let them uh, begin their presentations, I thought it would be good to just talk really briefly about what diversion prevention and rapid exit actually are. So really quickly, um, if you're thinking about prevention, diversion and rapid exit as a continuum of services, uh, that continuum would start with prevention. The idea here being you wanna prevent an upcoming housing crisis, you wanna prevent someone from becoming homeless and entering the homeless service system. Those priorities under prevention often include things we hear a lot about, things like eviction prevention assistance. Sometimes we hear um, utility payments or case management or budgeting classes, anything we can do to prevent an upcoming housing crisis for that household. In the event that um, we're unable to prevent, a housing crisis. At that point, when you need an immediate response to the housing challenges that a household is facing, you find um, that diversion practices are, are next in this continuum of services. This is where we're focusing on a household finding an alternative to entering an emergency shelter in the homeless system or entering an unsheltered situation where they may not have anywhere to stay. These Supports often do include financial resources, but a lot of times diversion is where um, unique, creative solutions come in. You might see mediation, you might see conflict resolution services under diversion. Um, there might be a need for help finding a new housing unit if someone is unfamiliar with that process or having a hard time finding a unit. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as providing supplies that a household might need to begin or to maintain um, employment. So it can be a host of different things. It's a problem solving process. Um, and the goal is to keep that family or that household from entering either emergency shelter or an unsheltered situation. In the event that diversion doesn't work or that we don't um, see an ask of help from a household until after they have already entered the homeless system, either through an unsheltered situation or through an emergency shelter stay, then we look at rapid exit. Very clearly exactly what it sounds like, uh, trying to get people out of an emergency um, shelter or unsheltered situation as quickly as possible. A lot of these resources may look like prevention. It may include financial resources for rent or security deposits or even back utility payments that might be required in order to start new utilities in a new unit. But it also pulls some of the pieces of diversion. It might include mediation or conflict resolution with a support person that that individual or family was staying with and there was a breakdown of communication and relationships. So they all include a wide variety of resources and services that go far beyond just a financial resource. They are all housing problem solving um, components and communities do them very differently. So we are interested to hear what Jen and Melissa have to say about what Lancaster and McKean County are doing around this work. So we're gonna start with Jen. I'm gonna turn my screen share off and let her take over. I am Jen Koppel. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I am the director of the office for the Lanco My Home Lancaster County Coalition, uh, Homelessness Coalition. And we are in our 11th year uh, serving Lancaster County residents. Um, I, I, would, uh, I have a, a small presentation to do on a prevention program that we call Schools First that we've been running for about a year and a half. But I do want to talk a little bit about some of the diversion work that we do as well. So a number of years ago, it was the 2012-2013 fiscal year, uh, we launched our coordinated assessment program, which is a requirement by HUD 
for us to have a way for folks to basically have one point of entry to, to triage folks and, and refer them to, in a coordinated way, the services that best uh, fit their needs. And at that time, we felt it was important for us to be able to do diversion work. We didn't really know at the time. I mean, again, you're talking you know, seven years ago at this point, but we didn't really know <clears throat> what that was going to look like. But I would tell you that over time, that's been a critical function of our coordinated assessment process because there are things that uh, the we call coordinated assessment chart in Lancaster County. There's a there is a function that the chart workers have. They were trained in mediation skills, so that's been a huge help um, as well <clears throat> to be able to help them. I'm sorry, I thought I turned my phone off and it's ringing, but I don't think you can hear it. Um, that they can use to, to get people out of the emergent situation that they're in using those mediation skills. Lots of times that's tenant landlord issues. Uh, we also offer some flexible funding at that entry point as well so that we can use those funds as diversion uh, for diversion activities as well. And at one time, now the pandemic has kind of changed, well not kind of, it's changed the landscape uh, dramatically that we see in Lancaster County. I would argue that's probably common across the country too. Um, Diversion is a little bit harder right now just because the eviction moratoriums, the just there's just not a lot of movement in the system. But up until the pandemic, we were able to divert upwards of 40 to 45 percent of the folks seeking services from us at that time. So that's that's been a significant asset to our community. It allows us to maintain the capacity of the shelters and then still be able to serve larger volumes of people because we have this diversion activity that we can do. So um, if no one has any questions, or we, I think we're going to take questions at the end. So I'm going to pause there and then I'm going to switch over to prevention because that's where we've been uh, very heavily focused the last two years. Um, in we, we fund uh, through the Homeless Coalition in Lancaster a, a prevention program that's located in Elizabethtown. Uh, it was something that we piloted, I believe, three years ago that we've been funding since then. And it was really to look at could we prevent evictions? Was there a way for us to measure if folks that were in this particular program that they would have become homeless without our help? Because that's always an argument. Well, that prevention, we never know if prevention works because you can't prove a negative. So how, how do you really know that you prevented that family from coming into the system? And we felt very strongly that it was working. We continue to fund that particular program um, we did talk to Franklin and Marshall College they did a, uh, to do a preliminary study for us to see if they could determine if we were preventing homelessness at all. And about, um, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, they presented us with some preliminary findings. And we were, in fact, according to their variables, preventing homelessness. So there is mechanisms to demonstrate that prevention really does work. Um, if you look at the landscape of where we are now, we have an eviction prevention network as well in Lancaster County that's been uh, really ramped up in the last 10 months, specifically around the eviction moratoriums and what we fear is gonna happen um, once the eviction moratoriums lift and just the rising and rising and rising number of evictions that we're seeing right now, even with the moratoriums in place. So that particular um, eviction prevention network is, um, very partner and relationship driven. We have local uh, service hubs in our community that are geographically clustered so that they're serving the entire county. All of those hub partners are represented in the eviction prevention network plus additional partners. Um, and then we use our 211 uh, call center that's located at United Way to help field some calls for folks that were coming in um, to the eviction prevention program. With uh, the rent relief program that the state, uh, the federal government through the state had put out, we did struggle to get those funds out. I, my understanding is that the entire Commonwealth struggled with that. Um, so the eviction prevention network was very heavily focused on that funding because it was so complicated. But we were able to still get out, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to, into the community. Um, actually, more than that, we actually, you know, in one particular borough, put twenty-two thousand dollars of rent relief into that particular borough. So, it's it was very significant to have the EPN framework and everything up and and ready to take on something as complicated as the rent relief program. Um, but that network has grown uh, specifically also during the pandemic because again, the communities in Lancaster are very focused on eviction prevention and worrying about like what eviction is going to do. If you think about 
the national statistics that we see that they the, the our national tech uh, consultants expect anywhere from 20 to 40 million people to be seeking homeless services due to eviction. And if we applied that methodology of that's you know, taking an average of 30 million people, what's that a percentage of the whole country? We apply that here, that basically would double the capacity that we've seen in the past. And we can't absorb that infrastructure. We don't have, we don't have the services for that. So while we're also doing other things to prepare for that, we have really focused on that prevention, that um, eviction prevention. So again, I would say like, I think that in that space as well, we have been able to um, keep folks from coming into the system by doing prevention. We also offer um, an innovative, for us, an innovative program around uh, water shutoffs, uh, particularly in the city of Lancaster, because if buildings are, you know, in, in the city, if you cannot pay your water bill and it gets shut off, the building's condemned, you're automatically out. You know, so we were trying to like target smaller um, sub issues that we could easily work with. So the water prevention program was one that we launched last year. And then the program that I'm gonna to talk to you uh, a little bit longer about is about a year and a half ago, um, we started a program called Schools First and um, it is relationships with all of our 16 districts in uh, Lancaster County. And I apologize, I have this cat who's incessant like about walking in front of me at the minute. So anyway, so the Schools First program was something that we felt was a good way for us to really start looking upstream about homelessness um, and how we could prevent families from coming into the system. We know that up until about a year and a half ago, our community was very focused on just the HUD definition of homelessness, which is very narrow. It didn't allow for a lot of prevention, which we why we weren't doing a ton of prevention at the time. But we knew that if we changed our local definition of homelessness to have the HUD definition, but also the McKinney-Vento definition at the school districts, those are kids that are doubled up or um, moving from house to house for economic reasons. Um, that we would be able to move a little bit farther upstream using sort of a population health lens and really start working about, you know, trying to, to slow the flow of families into our sheltering system. So <clears throat> what the Schools First program was specifically doing in its initial phases was we would approach a school district. We have 16 in the county, as I said. Um, we would approach a school district and we would talk to them about what we could offer as a coalition and what kind of resources we could bring expertise and all of that because we knew that part of the issue was that the school districts could would potentially be uh, unfamiliar with what services are in the community. So we wanted to make sure that we were coming and saying that we, you know, we weren't asking for something from them. This was something that we could offer to them. So just to make sure that you, this is a presentation that we would give to the school district, we would make sure that they understood that our mission was to provide the safe and quality home for anyone who are, who's experiencing or at risk of homelessness in Lancaster. And that was a big deal to the school districts because they felt that they couldn't access our system because we weren't able to work with those families that were doubled up. And then our vision statement is that we want to provide a quality um, experience for in personalized human and housing services. We wanted to pull out human services specifically because we've taken a very holistic approach while we are not specifically providing the human services, we have created the relationships to make sure that folks can get access to those as they need. Um, and then again, like, we wanna make sure that, that homelessness is rare, brief, and non-recurring. We don't want folks to come very often. We don't want them to stay very long and we don't want them to have to come back. And then you know, using that framework to say that this is where the school districts had a lot of potential impact is that in that rare, brief, non-recurring, because if we could keep them from coming at all, then we wouldn't have to worry about the trauma of that experience and then trying to get the, the family back into um, housing. So this information um, is a little bit older uh, just because of, you know, the, the largely because of the pandemic. Um, we haven't updated this slide, but you can see over on the right that 1093, that is just the school district of Lancaster alone. Um, and then the other districts are, you know, the, the smaller blocks. But in the 17-18 school year, there were 2,254 children experiencing homelessness in Lancaster County. And if you add in there, sometimes uh, kids were obviously in that unaccompanied youth space, so it was just them being counted as a single. But then if you added in those families, that would be a, a significantly higher number. 
We also estimated that that number is probably another one and a half times larger because of the stigma of uh, uh, accessing uh, homeless services, of just the lack of knowledge that the services exist, you know, anything like that. So um, we do actually believe that that number is significantly larger. So that's a, that's a huge issue for us in this particular county. Like we wanted to make sure that we, we were really addressing what was really resulting in large numbers of children uh, experiencing homelessness in our county. So the other thing that we know is that every school district, I mean, when we did our research and, um, and met with all of the 16 districts, we know that every school district's impacted. So 52% of the homeless students in Lancaster County live outside the city which was a big myth for us to bust because everybody believes, I shouldn't say everybody because we've been working on this, but the belief at the time was that homelessness was clustered in the city. So then you didn't have any homelessness in the county. And we presented actually this very presentation that you're looking at to our legislators, the full um, delegation of Lancaster County legislators. And some of the, de the delegation was surprised that they had homelessness in their, in their jurisdiction. The other thing that was surprising to us is that obviously we know that kids of all age age are affected, but more than 50% of the homeless students are fifth grade and younger. So it, it wasn't even that they were um, equitably distributed across the um, grade spectrum, but it was really like, you know, a little heavier on the, on the, on the little side, on the little, on the little kid side. We know that homelessness, um, kids are 87% more likely to drop out of school if they've experienced homelessness. So we want to make sure that in the whole scheme of trying to also look at how we address poverty holistically in Lancaster County. We wanted to make sure that kids were finishing school and that we were helping them get to that next place, that post-secondary credential. And then we know that kids without diplomas or GEDs are four and a half times more likely to experience homelessness. So we wanted to make sure like this was the picture that we're painting and we, we needed to, to understand like how we could impact at the school district. So what we did was we went, this one is uh, this is the, we would go into a district and we would frame up this challenge statement is how can we um, instill a collaborative student center approach to meet the individual needs of the students and then how can we empower unaccompanied youth because that was a very different issue that we discovered uh, through our work with the districts. While the districts all have homelessness and you would think that there's trends there's families that have been evicted you have families that are struggling with substance use. So those threads are consistent between each, uh, each school district. However, each school district also had its own very unique significant issue. As example, one of our districts in the Northwest part of the county had a significant population of unaccompanied youth when none of the other districts did. And unaccompanied youth across all, all grades. So you had from second grade to high school children living in an unaccompanied situation that meant that they did not have a legal parent or guardian. So it was, I mean, it could have been that they were living with an aunt or a family member, but it also meant that that aunt or family member didn't have a legal um, guardianship of that child. So then there was barriers that were put up for that family. Um, they couldn't access some benefits. There were just some challenges that that particular family might have. They also might be living with a neighbor, you know, and, and moving from place to place, even at little, at little age. So, other, air, other issues we discovered, um, obviously, you know, most people know that Lancaster County has a great Amish, like a large Amish population. And one of our school districts is very heavily in an Amish area. Well, the informality of Amish landlord leasing was not something that we had ever anticipated. So like understanding what that meant to keeping people in housing in a stable way was important for this work. And one other example I would give is that in our southern end of our county, there are, are still no cell phone towers. So there's a very large cut of the southern part of Lancaster County that has absolutely no internet. So, and, and no real cell service in some places. So, it, you know, again, how do we help kids in that environment, you know, as communities and schools move towards like a digital era, like especially now with the pandemic and kids working or uh, doing school remotely, like how do we keep these kids thriving? So when we would approach the district, we do this. Um, this is our flow of how the process works. Um, we would come into a district, engage them at both. We would meet with the superintendent and most likely the homeless student liaison at the beginning. And then we would come back and meet with really any, any social workers or anybody that the district felt was important 
We would look at their data. The data is the information that is uh, sub, um, submitted to the state. So it's de-identified, it's aggregate only, but we created a template that the districts can use across uh, to share information that's de-identified, but give a little bit more information about that particular family story. And then we would come in and do an asset map. We would do a little bit of secondary research, and then we would start designing uh, workshops and collaborative approaches, piloting ideas, learning from those, and then scaling them up. So this was a way, um, this is all of our districts, and this is an old slide, but I just wanted to show you that the way that we track this from red to green was where we were in those particular uh, phases so that we could you know, keep the districts engaged. The outcome that we wound up with is what you see here is we call this a toolbox, but this is all of the programs that we've created with the 16 districts that they can share. I mean, so this is like a toolbox. So you can, we've shared this across the districts. We've connected districts um, out of this work. We're also creating a youth advisory council um, for the uh, older youth to have influence over the system. When you look in the bottom left corner, you can see that it possibly, I know it's very light, but it is light blue around those clusters. And then it gets darker blue as you go up. And you can see short term, medium term timeline, and then versus complexity across the bottom. The ones that are in that bottom left corner are really confined to the four walls of the district. That's why it's short term and low complexity because the school districts control those things. Um, and what we talked about in here, some of the things that were really big learnings was welcome packets were not given to all of the families consistently across the district. So we helped create something that was consistent. Um, another thing was the stigma around asking for items and help. And a number of the districts uh, implemented a QR code that they would put into bathrooms for the kids to scan. And then it would open up a document that the kids could ask for whatever hygiene items or food items or you know, whatever that district had to offer in a very discreet way. Plus then the district staff took the time to also make that experience um, uh, not stigmatizing. So instead of like, you know, the kid gets on the bus with a giant blue bag, everybody knows that the blue bag came from, you know, the, the clothing closet, you know, they changed up how they would distribute the items, which was a significant help. And then uh, as you move over, another thing that was important for us was this idea of, of student advocates. Um, we're working right now with Donegal School District. They are creating a pool of advocates for kids that are outside of the district, but the, uh, outside of the parent structure. But these are kids, advocates that can help the students navigate through their um, school career and just kind of be that um, voice for the kids that don't really have a voice. And that's, we just launched that. If you move up a little bit, you'll see the Youth Advisory Council. That's uh, again, what we talked about, we're creating that now um, to make sure that the, the youth have um, the ability to influence the work that's being done with them. But the other piece that was important in that Youth Advisory Council was when we met with students at the districts, they asked to meet each other and to be connected to other students who were living in a similar situation. So a piece of that Youth Advisory Council is also um, peer connection. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then legal advocacy, we secured a law firm in Lancaster County that's willing to do pro bono work specifically for this um, activity. That could be anything from um, you have a 17 year old um, unaccompanied youth whose parents won't give them their benefit card and they need dental care. Or, and then, you know, how do you work, you get that benefit card from the parents? It could be a letter about eviction, it could be really anything. And then if you go all the way up to the top corner is unaccompanied youth transitional housing. Obviously that's the, the most complicated. It's the a longer, it's gonna take us longer to do that. Um, we have um, entered into arrangements right now with both Covenant House and Valley Youth House so that we can look specifically at how we can create scattered site unaccompanied youth housing you know, and help them through, you know, not just getting through school, but even beyond that in that life skill kind of area. Um, so I feel like I'm pretty close, if not over my time. So, oh, if I, right. so um, I think that the biggest, the biggest piece of this was that each school district, we did not hit resistance at any school district. And the, I, there was very clearly um, the relief that somebody was going to be able to come and help potentially, you know, like with whatever these challenges were. The biggest issue we got had to work through was the sharing of information. 
um, but when we showed the template that we had and that we were using the de-identified information that was being sent to the district, I mean to the state, and that seemed to alle alleviate a number of that, those things. So <clears throat> um, with the pandemic, obviously that ground everything to a halt for the most part, at least through the spring into the summer. One thing that we were able to work with uh, the school districts, some school districts over the summer, not all of our districts have had a summer feeding program. So <clears throat> the ones that didn't, we were able to connect local churches in some cases, as an example, um, with the Central PA Food Bank because they have a grant from the USDA that allows them to bring in basically, I think it's close to 88 pounds of food, shelf stable and produce and fresh things in two boxes that are free to the communities. So in one case, in the in Donegal School District is, was one of the examples, um, Donegal has a particular, has, a, has three churches that are working in this space. One of them is the Donegal Presbyterian Church. They are a very small church and they are taking a very small cut of Donegal. It's specifically just in the Maytown area. Um, but they started, they've been doing this food box giveaway since um, the summer. And they are going to continue through the spring at this point. So there's a team of volunteers that goes out every week, gives out these boxes. They started with 20. We are now up to 60. And then if anybody doesn't claim a box, like if there's boxes left over, we've created a relationship with the police department and they come pick them up and take them out to families that they know are like shut-ins or just unable to get the food. There is a food pantry in that particular uh, neighborhood, but it's only open during the day for about two hours every other week. So this was something that we do every week. It's at the end of the day, trying to get people who might be coming from work or going to work as an evening shift so that they could access the food. Um, and then beyond that, we spend a lot of time with the districts trying to help connect to um, internet service and things like that so that the kids who were not um, in school would have access to the learning, you know, the technology to be able to continue to learn. This program is going to continue to evolve, especially as we now are coming into, you know, this like spring of the pandemic year. We've been in this space for almost a year now. And what does that look like as we come into summer? So this is something that will continue to evolve. So that's my part of the presentation. That was that? wonderful, Jen. Thank you so much for that. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm going to let Melissa start her discussion and I'll just, Jen, point you to um, our chat box so you can respond to the question that came in there. They were looking for some contact information. All right, and Melissa, you want to tell us about your Home Connections program? I do. Jen, you're a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the Home Connections, Home for Good, it is a grant through the, uh, I just blanked out already, the PHFA. <laughs> um, we were awarded as a whole $415,000 for um, different diversion and prevention techniques. Um, a lot of what we've done is paying off public housing balances, um, landlord judgments, things like that to make housing more accessible to individuals. Um, the super, super neat thing about this grant is it's very, very easy to access. It's quick. Um, we have points of contact in the different counties. What happens is the individual, typically they're already connected with that, <clears throat> excuse me, that organization, um, one page application, the only documentation that's required is whatever the invoice is, whether it's a uh, public housing balance, utility balance, um, and I can get into some of that later, but one page application, no additional documentation required as far as birth certificates, social security cards, because I'm sure as everybody knows, a lot of times those are the roadblocks for people accessing um, any sort of assistance is those, those different identification pieces. Again, all we need is the social number, birth date, um, basic information. They'll turn that in. We do obviously require all the fun stuff the agency releases in HMIS because you are entered into HMIS. Um, and then whatever the invoice is, it gets emailed in, approved within 24 hours. The process itself is the point of contact organization will pay whatever the invoice is and our organization reimburses monthly. Um, 
we were very fortunate that the funds, because they were supposed to end December 31st, we were able to get them extended to March 31st. Um, as you know, with the pandemic, $415,000 has actually been super hard to spend because people are not getting evicted. They're not moving anywhere. So a lot of the funds have actually been used to um, pay off existing balances to help allow people to get into different housing programs. Um, some of the things, like I said, that we can use it for public housing balances, security deposits, first month's rent, um, household startup, Sometimes people are first time on their own, need startup goods, utility deposits, utility balances. A lot of times that's a huge roadblock for people to get into their own housing is they can't get utilities turned on in their name. Um, the cap per person slash household is $750 for the major expenses, the public housing balances, security deposits, such things such as that. Um, we do also help with gas cards for employment purposes, bus passes and tokens for employment purposes, and grocery gift cards. That cap is $100. Um, as of right now, we've helped upwards of 200 families with this grant, and I'm hoping, fingers crossed, um, to be able to assist way more families within the next two and a half months. Um, I just, working in housing, trying to assist families, um, like I said, I think we all know that that documentation piece is just such a roadblock to get people help. Um, and that's why I just love this because it's it's so easy, it's so fast, it's so quick. Um, I'm really hoping that more counties utilize this and partner with us. I actually just emailed um, a bunch of counties to, to remind them that we have this money and, and then to kind of invite other counties in because um, we, we would love to get it spent. Again, with the moratorium, um, we have not seen a lot of the eviction requests. Um, if it gets lifted on the 31st, I'm sure we're going to have an influx. If it does not, I'm hoping that we can get really creative. Um, because like I said, it's just, it's a great program. Um, I told you, Jen's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, I'm trying, there's some other things. I lost my cheat sheet. I'm so sorry. Um, I can put actually in the chat box, the contact information though, to be able to connect with our organization. If this is a fund that perhaps your county would be able to utilize. Melissa, can I ask, you mentioned, um, you mentioned it as PHFA, it's through the Home for Good grant, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So you mentioned that other counties can use it. So how does that work? Um, you're in McKean County, obviously. So right. if Jen and I are here. So if York or Lancaster <laughs> used your fund, how does that work? We're just encouraging the application to your uh, organization for this funding? Well, it would have to be counties in the Western COC. There you go. That's yes. what I wondered. <laughs> I, and I, you know what? That was on my cheat sheet that I can't find. Yes. Yeah, I wondered, I wondered if there was a cap or a location that you were really focused on, and there yes, should be. Yes, it's counties in the Western COC. All right, uh, and it, uh, someone in the audience asked what counties you cover currently. Sounds like you're open to new counties, but which ones uh, are currently participating? Right now, um, I could typically spit these off alphabetically. Crawford County, McKean County, Potter County, Elk County, um, Clearfield, Jefferson, Dubois, Westmoreland. There's 13. Give me just a second. Mercer, um, Venango, Warren Forest, Washington County, because we have a couple counties doubled up. Um, Fayette County, Greene County, Indiana County, and Lawrence County. That's amazing. Congratulations on that. You mentioned there's a, a cap, 750 per household for the larger items, rent, utilities, and then a, a smaller cap, $100 for things like bus passes, gas, groceries. Um, is this a one time? Uh, can folks come back around again and request assistance? As of right now, unfortunately, no. And what we've noticed is um, for some of the larger balances, especially when it comes to public housing balances, um, we've been able to piggyback 
this grant with another form of assistance um, that, that, that their specific county offers. So in our county, we have the um, homeless, <clears throat> the HAP program. So we piggybacked it a lot with the HAP program. That's a really excellent use. The homeless assistance program, rental assistance, it can provide a little bit of extra since the homeless assistance program has a pretty strong state cap on how absolutely. much assistance can be provided. Absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm looking to see if I have any more questions for you or if you have thought of anything else to share. I'm not. I do have a question about the one page application. Absolutely. How did, is it simply a matter of um, the reporting for Home for Good being so lenient um, that you were able to do that? Or yes. have you, is that what it was? It was just an yes. easy it, it's reporting? Yes, super basic information um, in HMIS. It's using that system. We really didn't need a whole lot of information from individuals. I know a lot of times it delves into, you know, substance abuse, mental health, things like that. Um, although we do ask it on the application, it's not included in HMIS, so we don't we don't really delve into it. Very good. I did see another question come through um, for you, and so what was the contact info for this program? So if you would like to type your contact info, Melissa, um, in yes. the chat box, then people can reach out to you with questions. Mm -hmm. um, the, if someone asked if it was PHFA, the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency oversees a funding source called Home for Good. And Home for Good can be applied for by actually um, continuum of cares in the different areas can apply for them. The Home for Good funding is how McKean provided this particular project. So if you were interested in Home for Good or learning more, PHFA might be able to direct you. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you to also um, identify and reach out to your local continuum of care. In a lot of the parts of Pennsylvania, those are regional and they are large. Um, but if you uh, go out to just Google and look for Pennsylvania COC, they have an excellent website for those areas that'll help you. Um, but you can also find some information through your local continuum of care about Home for Good um, to see how that works. Uh, how has COVID impacted your ability to roll out your program, Jen? Uh, this particular program or programs in general? <laughs> your choice. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer, I, I guess actually the answer is basically the same. I mean, we have spent, a, it's been diff, very difficult for us to rehouse people um, specifically because I think there's a number of factors. One, shelter in place order, we, we didn't have any showings, nobody was really working in the real estate industry in that space. But then with, uh, and I just had this conversation today, uh, about 75% of the population that we see each year is new to the system. So with the eviction moratoriums in place, even though evictions are ramping up, there hasn't been that flow into the system because biggest piece of our system has been um, new folks. So I would tell you that as far as shelter and especially winter shelter is concerned in Lancaster, this is the lowest December that we've seen census wise. Um, the challenge is, and my worry is for the future, is that we also lost capacity in our shelters because of COVID and the spacing between beds and just all of the things that go with that. Um, Outside of that, we actually opened about 10 new programs from March until December. Um, and we opened a quarantine facility. We opened, um, we expanded our outreach team. We opened a drop-in center. We opened a low barrier shelter. Like, and then we had our, you know, some, we actually just started some schools first programs. I didn't talk about those because they haven't really started yet. Um, but we did open two navigation programs with um, one that clusters uh, school district of Lancaster with Conestoga Valley and one with uh, Elizabethtown. So we were, we were still able to kind of open those new programs, but it's really just slow. And I know I'm just your moderator, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just echo that. Uh, obviously I'm in York County, so I'm across the river from Jen, um, but we are, we're in the exact same space. It is, there's a little bit of a bottleneck happening um, at all points in the homeless and housing process. <laughs> this point. Um, and we are definitely trying to get creative in finding spaces to, to move those folks um, that don't have a stable place in 
and keeping those that are in a place um, stabilized. So it has been a very, very unique and challenging atmosphere for prevention, diversion, and rapid exit. <laughs> Melissa, I'm sure you guys are, are seeing the same thing. And I'm not sure if you're, um, you probably do a lot of prevention with your program, but have you used some of that? You mentioned about using it with the HAP program for rental assistance. Have you seen a slowdown uh, in, in- Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yes, the bottleneck was the, the, the absolute perfect analogy to it. Okay, um, a question for anyone. So Jen or Melissa, um, what resources would you recommend for people wanting to learn more about diversion and prevention? Um, I might say like, you know, reach out to the different areas like the CUCs like you referenced, Kelly. I mean, I think that <clears throat> my experience is that most of the CUCs are trying, if not doing some level of prevention diversion. And I think that, um, you know, most of the leads should have, the CUC leads could have some contact information, I, I would think. I was going to echo what Jen said. Um, the the COC's websites, um, just clicking on, and it's super easy to navigate, um, clicking on your region to find out what resources are available. I'm going to go ahead and put that regional website in the, um, in the chat box. Since it does encompass quite a few of the communities in Pennsylvania, you'll find um, that there are a few, um, Lancaster and York are actually two of them, that we are individual single county continuums of care. Um, but this particular website will help you navigate the regional areas, which are most of the West and a large part of the Eastern part of the state. So I'm going to share that with you as well. Um, but you can always reach out, even, even if you just, you can even reach out to me, I'll put my contact information in. Uh, the continuums of care tend to know each other. Um, so if you're stuck and you're not sure who to contact, I'd, I'd be happy to help, you know, connect you with who the most appropriate person is in your community if you want to have that conversation. There are diversion and uh, really in-depth prevention training programs out there from national organizations. I think the National Alliance and Homelessness has one. Um, I think a few of the um, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development consulting firms have their own. So there are several out there, um, but I think working with your local continuum of care is the best way. If they're not doing work in that space or they're looking for encouragement from the community that there's an interest in it, it's really great to collaborate with them and to make sure you're all working together. The, the thing that makes prevention and diversion and even rapid exit work seamlessly and smoothly is when those different silos are working together. Jen talked about working with the school districts. It's not enough to just have social service or housing organizations. You want to make sure that everyone is working together to meet those needs and that everyone is talking to one another about the needs that they're seeing and brainstorming the best solutions for those. That's what makes these processes so successful. Okay, any additional questions? We are a little early. Any additional questions or comments um, from our, our panel? No? <laughs> okay. Well, I think we are gonna wrap up a little bit early. That's okay. Uh, wait, we'll wait a few minutes here and see if anyone else has additional questions for us. I'll put my chat in from, or my contact information in the chat box. Um, if anyone needs a little assistance, we'd be happy to help direct you as well. And look at that, one more question. Have you yeah. ever used um, hotel or Airbnb respite as relief um, or part of a host home agreement? We um, talked about this, but we haven't done it. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I was gonna say, Kelly, actually we, we're doing um, two things in that space now. Um, <clears throat> so as with a host home to divert family from homes, it's not so much yet, but we are, right now we have an RFP out <clears throat> in Lancaster County to contract with a hotel to do that as well as also like families that get evicted um, basically to create temporary space that's not it's not shelter necessarily because it's a hotel um, but at the same time it's also to take families that are 
in individuals who either might be living outside and are afraid to um, go into shelter because of COVID or you know just any kind of scenario like that. We we have uh, we are working right now in a hotel. We use a hotel um, for our quarantine space for individuals in shelter or living outside who are uh, being tested for COVID or have tested positive. And what we learned from that is that we need to be careful about either like making sure that we can staff the site um, just because individuals are challenged with what sometimes goes on in their life and like being a good hotel guest can be a challenge. Um, but we have taken the learnings from the quarantine and are gonna apply some different things to the, temp uh, the, the temporary uh, shelter concept that we're doing with the, um, with the hotel. We did actually work with a local township, East Lampeter Township, which is for us, if anybody's familiar with Lancaster County, I will tell you it's the tourist area where like Dutch Wonderland is, that whole strip is East Lampeter Township. That's where the hotels are clustered. And the, actually East Lampeter Township was very willing to work with us. And um, that um, they actually wrote an emergency declaration for us so that it, we could use any of the hotels and not just one specifically because they were committed to working with us. So That's fantastic. Uh, we did have a question. Oh, Melissa, did you have anything to, to weigh in there? I didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> um, so in our county, we actually, um, we partner with McKean County CYS, the Children and Youth Services. And, um, in an effort to not remove children because of homelessness, we actually have three homes that were purchased by McKean County CYS that we oversee. We sublet um, to families and during their time there, we aim for a 30 day stay. There's been times where it's been 60, there's been times where it was 90, it depends on the barrier, um, to help that assist that family to secure um, safe, suitable, affordable, permanent housing. Um, so that we didn't have to remove, or they didn't have to remove their, their children from the home. Um, we also have, because we have a very, very small, McKean County, if anybody's familiar with it, is super small, super rural. Um, like literally all we have is Zippo lighters. That's our claim to fame. Um, but we have a very, very small shelter that's located here in Bradford. We have zero public transportation um, outside of our city limits. So our very small shelter is always a capacity and their wait list is, I can't even imagine, it's probably as long as my arm. Um, so we also, they were able to utilize CARES dollars to um, partner with a local hotel for vouchers for the hotel um, in an effort to keep people so they didn't become street homeless. Um, and then we also, we have, we're very blessed to have several um, churches, local churches that also supply vouchers. They have um, actually homelessness, homeless prevention kind of built into their church budgets to be able to help with vouchers throughout the year. So it's, our community has gotten very, very creative for as small and for as few resources we have. They're very generous and creative. So it's worked out really well for us. I love to hear that. I love when there's creativity in the community, when something is rigid. Jen mentioned how rigid the, the federal definition of homelessness is, and I think it hinders a lot of us. And it's great to see that creativity to work around those limitations on federal dollars. Uh, someone did ask uh, if Home for Good was still going on. So I think this is a two-part question. Um, Melissa's project in McKean County is the Homes Connection Grant. It was funded by Home for Good. That particular project is going to run through March 31st of this year. The Home for Good funding stream um, is a three-year term of funding that's approved by the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh voting partners. So we are at the end of uh, the first three-year term for that project here in Pennsylvania. Um, so I think we're all hopeful that uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank members see how valuable their flexible uh, funds are and, and are going to continue that. I don't know, Jen, I have not heard an approval for another three-year term. I don't know if you have or not. Um, yeah, so I'm, I didn't even think about this, but I'm actually on the board at PHFA. Um, so there is talk about continuing that, but it's not been solidified yet, but I think everybody's hopeful that it'll be. I mean, we're just keeping our fingers crossed because it's been super useful, especially in this season. Yeah, the Homes for Good as funding, just like just like Melissa talked about, has been an excellent gap filler 
for a lot of communities. The flexibility allows the community to say, this is where we have this, this hole in our service continuum and being able to fill that. So I think we're all hopeful that that'll continue to be a great funding stream. And as I mentioned before, if it's something you're interested in as a provider of service, please connect with your continuous care because those funds do um, typically work through the continuous care in your area. Uh, we did have another question about families with serious barriers to renting. Um, have you used short-term leases as trial housing opportunities as part of your diversion strategy? We have not done that as part of diversion. What we do though, for families or individuals that have serious barriers, we do have a mechanism to help get them into housing that is not a year lease because the federal uh, rapid rehousing money requires a year lease for that. So we have created an ability for families and individuals who can't, for whatever reason, they don't wanna enter into a year lease. They don't have the, the barriers to that. So we do, we created a way for them to, to be able to rent shorter term lease and still get rehoused, but not part of a diversion strategy now. Okay, perfect. All right, I, that's the follow-up of all the questions I see. We do have a few minutes left in our session, so I'll give it a minute here and see if we get anyone else that might have a question for us. I will say York County has not done um, the short-term leases as trial housing opportunities. Um, see the value, um, but have not, have not found that niche funding for that yet here. Okay, it looks like we don't have any further questions. I think we will wrap up a few minutes early. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Housing Alliance, for making this go so smoothly. We appreciate all of your help. And of course, everyone's um, contact information was shared. So please reach out if you have any additional questions for anyone. Yes, thank you. Nice to meet you, Melissa. It's awesome. Thanks, guys. Kelly, I always am happy to see you. I didn't mean that to leave you out of that, but I'm always happy to see you. I don't feel left out. Thank you. <laughs> Hey ladies, thank you. See ya.